Hello. In the last video I made on financial math problem solving for actuarial exam 2, I said I wanted to do a few short problems, short videos on internal rates of return. Well, as you can see, this is a longer video. And I decided I actually do want to get into net present value here in the next video or two. So I'm going to tie these things together. But I think it would be good to continue one more time reviewing the idea of an internal rate of return and also take the opportunity to review some algebra and calculus uh, facts and techniques that you should have learned in the past. We're in chapter 5 of this book right now. We'll eventually be getting into chapter 7 and definitely your algebra and calculus skills will be needed in chapter 7. So it might not be a bad idea to review that. So this is a transaction with three rational number internal rates of return. Not that that's really an important thing. Typically, internal rates of return are going to be irrational numbers. But just to review algebra and calculus, I thought it would be good to do an example like this. It's an example I actually made up on my own. I did not take this out of a book. We've got an investor that's contributing uh, 30 at time 0, 59 at time 2, and receiving returns of 77 at time 1 and 14 at time 3. So we've got four transactions here, and the signs are going to alternate negative, positive, negative, positive. We're going to get a cubic that um, definitely could have some internal rate of re return solutions that maybe are not meaningful. But let's go ahead and see what happens. In part A, we'll be doing algebra and calculus to show that there are three rational interest rates, internal rates of return, also known as yield rates, only one of which is financially meaningful. Actually, it's going to be the one with the positive value of i. The other ones are going to be negative. And continuing to review algebra and calculus, we'll use one step of Newton's method, also known, known as the newton raphson method, and a calculator to approximate the financially meaningful answer. In both situations we're actually going to use the calculator. And in watching this video, you're going to want to have your calculator ready because you're going to want to, I'm going to, to save time, just say what certain answers are, and you are going to want to pause the video and check that I'm correct, okay? To get as much as you can out of this video. So let's uh, draw a quick timeline here. Time 0, 1, 2, and 3. We've got negative 30 at time 0 and negative 59 at time 2. Those are the contributions. Getting returns that are positive of 77 at time 1 and 14 at time 3. And therefore, the um, equation of value, thinking in terms of present values, would be negative 30 plus 77v minus 59v squared plus 14v cubed. Okay, so a cubic. Set that equal to zero, solve for v. Um, in general, there, you, there is a method for finding solutions of cubics, though they could get irrational or complex number roots. This one happens to have all rational roots. But what if you didn't know that and you're trying to verify it? How would you do that? Probably the best thing to do is think of this as a function of v. You could call it p of v, and that is suggestive of the idea of net present value, which we will again get to soon. And it might be helpful to graph it first to help us get guesses for possible solutions of V. And let's pretend we don't have a graphing calcula calculator. We only have a financial calculator, so we can't graph it. So we need some calculus to help us graph this. So the first derivative and the second derivative could be helpful. The first derivative is going to be 77 minus 118V plus 42V squared. Of course, you should remember from calculus that if you set that first derivative equal to zero, that that will, and solve for v, that'll give you the critical points, which could be local maxes or mins. And this is something you should check on your own. Okay, I'm not going to take the time to show you the details. If you do this, if you solve for v, you should get two irrational numbers. You can use the quadratic formula. They end up being approximately 1.03057 and 1.77896. Okay, so you should check that on your own. Those are going to be the two critical points. And it will turn out this one will be a maximum and this one will be a minimum, which shouldn't be surprising since the graph of the cubic having a positive leading coefficient for v cubed should look like that. In fact, we can start to make the graph over here on the right. You can also see that p of 0 is negative 30, so that's going to be the vertical intercept there. p of 0 is negative 30. There's your v-axis. Before we plug in some other numbers, let's also calculate the second derivative to find our inflection point. 
P double prime of V would be negative 118 plus 84V. If we set that equal to zero and solve for V, because in fact that second derivative does change sign, the solution of that will be the first coordinate of the inflection point. It'll be at 118 over 84. It's a rational solution. 59 over 42, and that's approximately 1.40476. Okay, so there's some practice with calculus. If we plug in a couple other points here, P of 1, for example, you should check that you get 2. And plug in 2, it turns out that's one of the roots for V. You should get 0. So we can start making the graph here. Uh, so one of the roots, which must be the financially meaningful one, is going to be just less than 1. You know, V just less than 1 is the typical kind of financially meaningful situation, technically even down close to 0, but usually it's close to 1 but less than 1. And uh, especially since we are... We aren't losing money here, by the way, in this transaction. We are contributing 89 total and receiving 91 total, so it should be a positive um, rate of return if it's going to be financially meaningful. So that's going to be the one we're after, really, right there for V. Less than 1 that's going to correspond to a positive I. Uh, v of 1 is 2, so this gets up to 2, and then there's a maximum when V is slightly bigger than 1, goes slightly higher than 2. There's an inflection point when V is about 1.4, so right about there, and uh, turns out, well, I'm kind of jumping the gun here. I'm just going to tell you, it turns out P of 3 halves is also a 0, so V equals 3 halves is another discount factor version of the internal rate of return not going to be financially meaningful, but it will intersect there at three halves and come back and intersect again at two. This is the graph of P of V. Okay, so we're using calculus to help us <clears throat> find that. Um, you could certainly, and you probably should, check that three halves is a root. Go ahead and plug three halves into there, and it does turn out to be a rational root. What's the quickest way now to find the third rational root besides for V, besides 2 and 3 halves, that are going to correspond to rational roots for I as well? Um, quickest way would actually be to, to do some synthetic division. You could also do long division. Um, 2 is a root. So what I can do is I can set up a diagram like this where I put the 2, the root, over here, and I put the coefficients of P of E in here in the opposite order from highest power to lowest power. So I'll go 14, negative 59, positive 77, and negative 30. Here we're practicing our algebra skills. This is again called synthetic division. And the method is you add down the columns and you take the number over here and multiply to get the next number that goes just under these different coefficients. So what this means is I go 14 plus 0 to give me a 14. Multiply 2 times 14 is 28. Put the answer here. Add, don't subtract, negative 59 plus 28 is negative 31. Multiply 2 times negative 31 is negative 62. Add 77 plus negative 62 is positive 15. Multiply 2 times 15 is 30. Add negative 30 plus 30 is 0. And the fact that that's 0 uh, means the remainder when you divide P of V by V minus 2 is 0, meaning that 2 is a root. Okay, and it's going to allow us to factor P of V as V minus 2 times a quadratic whose coefficients are these numbers. 14v squared minus 31v plus 15. I won't write it down because I want to show you one more step here. Okay. By the way, before I show you that next step, if one of these coefficients, for example, this one were 0, you would want to include the 0 there. That's just something to be aware of in synthetic division. So now I'm going to do it again using the fact that I know ahead of time you wouldn't necessarily that 3 halves is a root. By the way, if you didn't know 3 halves was a root, um, and you didn't know something called the rational root theorem, you could guess it from the graph perhaps, or 
Um, you could, well, try using your graphing calculator. What, what was I going to say? I was going to say one more thing besides that, but now I'm forgetting what it was. Oh, you could use the quadratic formula. That's what I was going to say. Um, the quadratic whose coefficients are these things, 14v squared minus 31v plus 15. But I'll use synthetic division again, bring down this 14, multiply 3 halves times 14 is 21, add to get negative 10, multiply to get negative 15, add to get 0. So when you divide 14v squared minus 31v plus 15 by v minus 3 halves, you get 14v minus 10 um, with a remainder of 0. So what all this means is that p of v can be factored as 2 is a root, v minus 2, 3 halves is a root, v minus 3 halves, and what's left over there is also 14v minus 10. So the other root's going to be 10 14ths or 5 sevenths. By the way, you can also think of this as 2 times v minus um, 2 times 7v minus 5, and you can bring the 2 through here. So another way to factor this is as v minus 2 times 2v minus 3 times 7v minus 5. But the third root that is going to be the financially meaningful one is v equals 5 sevenths, just less than 1, which corresponds to i equals 1 over v minus 1 is 7 fifths minus 1 is 2 fifths, 0.4 or 40 percent. That is the answer for the one that is financially meaningful. The other ones, v equals 2 and v equals 3 halves, correspond to i's that are negative. v equals 2 implies i is 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. And v equals 3 halves gives i equals 2 thirds minus 1 is negative 1 third. Which of these does the financial functions on a calculator give? I don't know. Let's go ahead and see. You might hope that it would give you the financially meaningful one, but uh, maybe it doesn't. Let's see here. Go to my CF. Um, turn it on first. CF, cash flow. Second, clear work. Actually, I did do it ahead of time, so I do know the answer, but okay. Negative 30 is at time zero. Enter that. Tab down. 77 is at time 1. Enter that. Tab down. Leave the frequency at 1. Negative 59 is at time 2. Enter that. And positive 14 is at time 3. Enter that. Now type IRR compute. And you get oh, the, a non-financially meaningful one. Negative 33% corresponding to giving you the i of negative one-third. It's giving you that one. And that's not financially meaningful, again, because we are receiving more money than we are investing. Again, we're investing 89 here. We're receiving 91 more. It's got to be a positive i that's going to be financially meaningful. Okay? So that's part A. Now let's do part B. Use one step of Newton's method and a calculator to approximate the financially meaningful one, this one right here, though I'm going to approximate it in terms of v first, and then I'll get the version of i again. So we're again looking at p of v. And I don't know if you use Newton's method in the past or not, but the way to do it, to try to estimate a root of v, is to give an initial guess. We could guess 1, for example, but it turns out 1's not that great to guess, actually. I tried it. I'm going to guess 0 0.7, pretty close to 5 sevenths for V. 5 sevenths is a little bit bigger than 0.7. And you use an, a recursive or iterative equation that people often write like this. I'm going to use V. Sometimes you see it with X. V sub N plus 1 is V sub N minus P of V sub N divided by P prime of V sub N. So if we have an initial guess, call it v0, which I'm going to use 0.7 for, we plug that into here to find v1. v1 is going to be 
v0 minus p of 0.7 divided by p prime of 0.7. Okay? Where p of v is this function and p prime of v is this function. I'm not explain by the way, in all of this, I'm not explaining why these methods work. I mean the calculus one hopefully makes a lot of sense. I'm not explaining why the synthetic division works. I'm not explaining why Newton's method works. They're not too hard to explain, but you should look into that on your own if you're interested. And I'll just tell you what these end up being. You should check it on your own. You end up getting 0.7 minus approximately, well, actually exactly, negative 0 0.208 up on top there, divided by 14.98 there. Let's do that in the calculator just to do one thing in the calculator here besides the financial functions. 0 0.208 divided by 14.98 is that. Two negatives make a positive. Add this to 0.7. So the first one step of Newton met Newton's method gives 0.7139 approximately for our root. What is 5 sevenths actually? It's 0.71428. 6. So we're pretty close. It's not too, too bad. One more iteration would get us even closer. Okay, I'm not going to take the time to do it. Um, by the way, 0.7139, if we wanted to convert that back to i, you would take 1 over it and then subtract 1, getting your approximation of i to be 0 0.40076, very close to 0.4. Okay? So I hope you appreciated reviewing calculus. Before I stop the video here, I should say I would encourage you to also look up one more thing to look up something called the rational roots theorem that would give you the possibilities for the rational roots of any polynomial um, if there are any rational roots. This one of course has three rational roots. The rational roots theorem in this case it involves looking at divisors of the coefficient of the highest power in the, in the constant term and you get a finite number of possibilities it's a lot of them in this case but uh, graphing it helps you guess as well. I won't take the time to go through the rational roots theorem, but I would encourage you to look that up.